Hello and welcome to Saints Online. You're about to hear a message that's part of a series. Check it out and consider joining us in person on Sunday. We pray that as you listen, you be equipped for the season of life you find yourself in, that you would grow in hunger for God and discover His unmatched love, grace, and plans for your life. Get in touch with us at saints.my slash hello for more details on the program and resources we have to help you discover more of God through our church. Make sure to subscribe to our Saints YouTube and podcast channels so you don't miss any of our weekly content. Enjoy this message from our lead pastor, Joel Burden. Well, hey everyone, it's so good to have you joining us today. My name is Joel and I'm the lead pastor here at Saints. And recently we changed our name from Hope City to Saints. If you haven't heard about that news, then scroll down on the YouTube or go and find us online and you can figure out that whole story. This was just the big seismic shift in the history of our church that after, gosh, eight and a half years, uh, we renamed our church and we just took our church, not in a new direction, but just in a in a clearer sense of what God wants to do in this community. And so I'd love to bring you up to speed on that. If you haven't gone and checked out the We Are Saints video, uh, we would love to have you go and check that out on YouTube. Um, but if not, we wanna welcome you down to this community. Maybe you're in KL, maybe you're around the area and you haven't got a church to call home. Uh, we would love you to come on down and see what God is doing at Saints. It's a wonderful community. God is moving so powerfully uh, through the times of worship and through the preaching right now. And so uh, what a great decision before Christmas to get yourself into the house of God and planted. And uh, hey, even if this isn't the church for you, we will help you find one. Get yourself into a local community. So we're on week two right now leading up to Christmas. And we're talking about the meals that Jesus had with certain people through the book of Luke. And today I want to draw your attention to the meal with Simon. This is in Luke chapter 7 verses 36. So I'm going to read this all together and then I'm just going to do my best in, you know, 15 minutes or so to pull out a couple of the things that we're talking about in the preaching and let you into what's happening in our church right now. So let's read it together. Luke chapter 7. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. And a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he thought to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender, and one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back. And so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? And Simon replied, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. And then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. And therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to this woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Well, we're talking this month about meals with Jesus and meals are really important to us because whenever we have a meal, maybe Thanksgiving or Christmas or Chinese New Year, we have this sense of abundance around the table. Don't you just love a good feast? Like maybe you can think of the last time you got the whole family together. Maybe people traveled in from their hometown and everyone was sitting in their places. And there was just this great sense that we're a family. And back in Jesus culture, in the in the Jewish culture, first century Jewish culture, meals and tables were the very heart of family culture. People didn't eat just 
to be functional, like I got to eat, let's go grab some food as a takeaway. It was the meal that brought people together and united people. And you know, that's one of the reasons why it was such a privilege to be seen to be sat at the table with the Son of God. And can you think of any more beautiful picture than you and me of our salvation? We are seated at the table with the Son of God. And not only there like in a crowd, but we are there and there's a seat with our name on it, that you belong here. That's what Christ did through the cross. He made a a place for you to come into the family of God so you could sit down and feast and dine with everything that God is. And so we're looking at the meals that Jesus had in real life back in the first century because they kind of reflect the mission and purpose of Jesus today, that you and me have a seat with him. Last week, if you haven't gone back, go and listen about the the meal with Levi. Levi was this tax collector who was far from God and had made so many mistakes and failures, yet Jesus welcomed him to the table. And it was simply because Levi decided, I'm going to follow Jesus's call and I'm going to admit my need for him. Those two things got him a seat at the table. And I just want to underline this to you. You know, it wasn't because Levi was a great man. It wasn't because he'd lived a sinless life. It wasn't because he had any kind of performance that impressed God. It was simply because Matthew or Levi admitted his need for Jesus. Isn't this amazing? You and me can get a seat at the table because we simply admit our need. Like, God, I messed up. God, I've got broken places on my heart. But if, if I'll simply come to you with sincerity, humbly ready to receive, repentant in my heart, I can have a seat at the table with you, Jesus. And so that's the story of Matthew last week. But then we come to this next meal, which is only a couple of chapters later. And this is the meal with Simon. And this one's amazing because there's not only one main character, but there's two main characters. You know, like a movie that's got like two celebrity co-stars. You know, it's got like Tom Cruise and someone else. Well, this is that kind of story. We've got the woman who is a sinful woman, AKA prostitute. And then we've also got the guy whose house this is. We've got Simon. Simon is this Pharisee, this very wealthy, respected man. And you'll hear the story that we just read out. It kind of flicks between the two people. A couple of things you got to know before we unpack this. First of all, when meals were had in Jesus' time, it wasn't like your Ikea six-seater table, you know, the one that extends at the edges and everyone sat around eating and dining. These, These tables were low, that they would almost be down towards the floor. People would be reclining back on couches, maybe, you know, elbows up towards the table and feet out. And and during these meals, anyone could kind of come in and spectate what was happening. So you'd have people from the public just walking in the room, spectating what was going on at this meal. And as this meal's taking place, probably like after church service with Jesus and Simon, this woman comes in from the town and everybody knows who she is. She's the sinful woman. We don't know how they know, but there's something about the way she dresses or the way that she looks or the way that she presents herself. People know who this woman is. And she is obviously trying to approach Jesus to do something. She's holding this perfume and she wants to bring perfume and pour it out on Jesus's feet. Now, this is really important in that climate. Feet would get dry and dusty. I don't know, I hate dry, dusty feet. You gotta have a nice moisturizer, you know what I mean? You gotta have supple feet. And that was the idea. This woman was gonna come with an expensive perfume and she was gonna bring this luxury to Jesus out of the grace. She's heard about him. She knows he's a good man. She wants to pour oil on his feet. She wants to do something to soothe the tired feet and to help him. But before she can get close, the woman bursts into tears. She starts weeping. I don't know if it's her overwhelming sense of guilt, the life that she's lived, or whether she's just in this zone of abundant, radiant grace. She knows that she's in the presence of the Son of God, but tears start falling from her eyes and she can't do what she came to do. And as she's there, kind of overwhelmed and overexpressing everything that's happening with all this emotion bubbling up, she couldn't pour the oil. She's standing at the feet of Jesus, wanting to bring this gift, but she's simply overcome with emotion. That's probably the first time Jesus even knows that she's there, is when her tears start falling against his skin. And he turns around and everyone else at the table turns around and they see this woman. All eyes are on this sinful woman. And instead of running away, she does something quite amazing. She she kneels down 
in the midst of all the embarrassment and all of the eyes being on her, she kneels down and she undoes her hair, which was just, that's not done in this culture. She undoes her hair, it's a sign of intimacy, it's kind of a sign of expression. And, and she starts to dry the tears that she has weeped on Jesus' feet with her hair. Like, what a powerful picture. And everyone around, fully knowing that this woman is a, is a prostitute, they are disturbed. They're kind of disgusted. How can Jesus allow this woman to touch him, knowing who she is, and knowing what that would kind of do to the table and all these other respectable people? How can Jesus not be pulling his feet away? But Jesus just lays there. And he allows this woman to do this wonderful expression of almost worship. And after she's done this, she takes the perfume and she pours it out on Jesus's feet. She kisses his feet. Now, why is all of this really important? What does this say about the woman? Normally, if you've heard this passage before, we start talking about the woman and the great things she's done and how wonderful it is that we can also break open the bottle in worship. But I wanna just draw your attention to one thing today. Because this story is not just about the woman, it's also about revealing the other character. Because we see how expressive and overwhelmed this woman's love for Jesus is, but it also reveals Simon and his coldness and his indifference and his silence. There's all this expression of worship and love's going on. Here is Simon sat at the table thinking thoughts that are preventing him from coming to Jesus. This is the funny thing about Simon. Simon was also seeking Jesus. You know, Simon was a Pharisee and the Pharisees really didn't like Jesus, but Simon was different. Simon knew that Jesus was the son of God. He's got this idea that this man's special and I wanna invite him to my house. Think about the only other Pharisee that ever came into contact with Jesus was Nicodemus who did it at night. So for Simon to invite Jesus, he's putting himself out there. He's gonna be ridiculed. He's gonna get some kind of persecution for this, but he knows there's something special about Jesus. Simon wants Jesus, just as the woman wants Jesus. Both of them are seeking. This is not those typical stories where one person's seeking Jesus and the other one is rejecting him. Both of them want Jesus. But in just a couple of verses time, the woman is gonna be accepted and welcomed, whereas Simon is gonna be rejected. And I don't know about you, but that just freaks me out. The fact that we can all be seeking Jesus. We can all be trying to get closer to him on our journey. But some of us, the way that some of us respond to him, it's going to be welcomed in. It's going to be delight. We're going to be welcomed right into the heart of God and experience intimacy and fellowship and life. And some of us seeking Jesus, we're going to feel this blockage. So what was the difference between the woman's response to Jesus and Simon's? Well, I wanna say the first thing here is, Simon approached Jesus with reservations, but the woman approached Jesus with her whole life. She gave Jesus everything. And Simon's kind of there, a bit removed. You know, he's very thoughtful. He's trying to process stuff through in his mind. He's probably approaching Jesus quite intellectually. Does anyone here, you know, you like to overthink things? I always overthink stuff. You know, like I go to the supermarket, and I can't do a quick shop. I have to compare all the prices, you know, how much are the local cornflakes compared to the Kellogg's cornflakes. I have to compare like the chicken breast, like which one is more plush, which one isn't. It's called this analysis paralysis. And my brain is just always going on a thousand thoughts a minute. I just can't relax and just make a decision. And sometimes that prevents me, you know, from taking action. Well, Simon's kind of like that to an extreme with Jesus. He's so overthinking, who is Jesus? What has he come for? He's really intellectual in his response. And that kind of shows him up. And we see it in this verse, in verse 39, it says that when the Pharisee who had invited him, that's Simon, he said to himself, what does that mean? He's thinking, he's thinking, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sitter. And if he is a prophet, surely he knows that, but he obviously can't be a prophet because he can't know who she is and why is she touching him and why is he not reacting? And what are other people thinking about this? Do other people think badly of me? I wonder what I should do right now. And you can see him kind of tripping over his thoughts and he's refusing just to go in and show expression and compassion towards Jesus because he's so stuck in his head. Whereas this woman's response is deeply personal. Like she's embarrassed. 
She's putting herself out there, but she is giving Jesus a wholehearted response. You know, I think it's quite revealing later on, Jesus says, Simon, this woman, she wept over me. This woman hugged me. This woman kissed me. You can imagine Simon being like, hold on a second. You want me to hug you? Did you want me to kiss you? Did you want me to weep over you? And Jesus would be like, yeah. If you really understood who I was and how much I've changed everything for you, of course you would show just a little bit of emotion. You know, Simon is seeking Jesus, but he's being held back because he's refusing to dive in with a personal faith. For a long time, I really struggled with this. I struggled with showing emotion to God. And I think it's because all the way through my teenage years, I was trying to look for rules to follow. I was trying to look for what I could get away with. I was trying to ask God, how much is too much? How far is too far? Really what I wanted is I wanted the principles of Christianity, but I didn't want the person. I didn't want to truly submit my life to the person of Jesus. I wanted to know three keys on how to live a great life, but I didn't truly want to submit everything to him. That's me trying to take the principles without the person. But what I've discovered is the person of Jesus is very real. He is very alive. He is fully God and he has a will for you and he has commands for you. And when you follow Christianity, you don't just follow a religion, you follow a person. And a person requires a personal response. It requires an intimate response. It requires you to come to Jesus with your whole heart and say, I'm not just following principles. I'm not just following rules. I want to follow a person. See, if we don't do that, I love what Tim Keller says. If we don't do that, we get a religion without tears. We get a religion without letting our hair down. And probably worst of all, we get a religion without ever having touched God, never touched his heart never have him touch our hearts. We, we get this cold, impersonal Simon the Pharisee response rather than the welcome and the embrace of this woman with Jesus. I love this verse in Jeremiah. I'll leave you with this today. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says this. It says, you seek me, you will seek me and you will find me, but only when you search for me with all your hearts. How true is that? That, that maybe some of us are not quite seeing who God is and what he wants from us because we're so hiding behind intellectual approach. It's not that thinking is bad. Think through everything and, and go through Alpha and go and do all of the resources we've got. Go, go and do some grow courses, learn theology through the Saints College. It's not that thinking is bad. It's just that if all we do is think and we never fully give God our hearts, we're going to have an impersonal religion without tears. But Jesus wants us to be deeply moved by who he is. You know, the woman was deeply moved. He goes on later, Jesus talks about this this debt that was forgiven. The woman was deeply moved because she realized what a great debt she had and what a beautiful cost that Jesus paid. And Jesus didn't pay that cost impersonally. He didn't send an angel from heaven to go and redeem mankind. He didn't send a sacrifice. God didn't send somebody else to do the job. Jesus came in a deeply personal way to give himself for you, to give his own body for you. And now he's a deeply personal savior in heaven for you. He's interceding at the right hand of God for you personally. Everything about the way that Jesus interacts with us is is a personal God, having a personal relationship, having a personal vision for you. My one response today, I know there's so many other things we could say about this passage, but my one call to us today is could we come to Jesus personally? Could you tell him what's really going on in your heart? Could you come to him with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul and all of your strength? Not just approaching him with your mind and your thinking, but giving him everything that you are, like this woman did. And when we do that, we're promised that we won't be excluded, but we will be welcomed in to the heart of God. This Christmas, let's come to Jesus with everything that we have. Come on, let me pray for you right now. Lord, I I thank you for the opportunity just to read your word and being reminded that you are good. You're a beautiful God. You're a wonderful savior. You did so much for us on the cross. You pulled out your life for us so that we could have a relationship with you. God, I just pray today that wherever people are listening, whatever we are doing, that we would just stop in this moment and we would say, Jesus, you can have my heart. 
You're not just gonna have my religion. You're not gonna have my church attendance. You can have my life. And I lay it down, every part of me, heart, soul, mind, and strength, I give you it all. Why don't you just say that to Jesus right now? Jesus, I give you everything. I respond to you, not with my intellect, not just with my action, I give you my whole life. You can have it all, Lord Jesus. And we pray all of this in your precious name, amen. Well, God bless you guys. Come join us next week as we talk about the meal with Zacchaeus. Special week next week because we've got tag team preachers, three brand new preachers from our church, bringing you the word together. I can't wait to show you all of that. And if not, come down. We've got Christmas time happening real soon. Remember on the 24th of December, we're having our big Christmas service here and we would love to see you there. God bless you guys. We love you and we'll see you real soon. If you enjoyed this message, check out more on our Saints YouTube and podcast channels. For those who want to know more about Jesus, find a Christian community to be a part of or you're exploring faith, why not join us this coming Sunday for our 11 a.m. service? We are a growing, vibrant church in the heart of Petaling Jaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, with an interactive kids program for 2 to 12s, facilities for parents with under 2s, and freshly brewed coffee available from 30 minutes before each service. We're confident you'll live encouraged. Find out more on our website, saints.my, or follow us on Instagram and Facebook now. We can't wait to host you.